All right. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn over to 2 Corinthians. We're continuing our expositions through 2 Corinthians. Uh, we're just getting started, really. We're in chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses uh, 12 through 14 this, mor this morning. And I'll be reading those in a moment. A mother, uh, she was helping her son with his spelling assignment and she came to the words conscious and conscience and when she asked uh, her son if, if he knew the difference between the two he responded sure mom and here's how he how he defined it conscious is when you are aware of something and conscience is when you wish you were <laughs> The conscious, our conscience, is a wonderful thing. It truly is. It's kind of like a barometer for our soul. It can be. It warns us of that which offends. And it's silent if we're on the right track. It, it, you know, it, it doesn't ring those bells, uh, send the flags up. For Paul in our text for this morning, it is... His conscience uh, that he refers to, he references as he addresses his dealings with the Corinthian believers. Here in this text, we begin to pick up on, if you will, the undertones of the accusations that were being leveled against Paul by his opponents at Corinth. And at the writing of the letter, the second Corinthians Many of the believers, and we're going to get into that somewhat today as well, we'll see that, were coming around on Paul, coming back to Paul. They were doing the right thing. They were responding to his uh, ministry to them and his rebuff, if you will, his corrections. But there were still that, that element who have uh, a stronghold uh, in the, the believing community, and they... Uh, we had it out for Paul. They were opposed to him. And so he writes 2 Corinthians to answer certain charges. By the way, false charges that were leveled against him. Uh, these included a few, his authenticity of apostleship, how he was an apostle. What, what He wasn't authentic. They, they, they level that accusation. Uh, they raise uh, issues uh, to matters of conduct, his conduct, amongst the Corinthian believers. They raised issues of his motives, uh, his sincerity uh, as to his commitment to them. These are accusations they made against him in his relationship to the Corinthian people. We know, we'll find as we move through the study in chapters 10 through 13, uh, there is a, a, a frontal defense of his apostleship. He will defend his apostleship. And then in chapters 8 and 9, it deals with the propriety of his conduct re regarding the collection for the saints in Jerusalem. They raise that as an issue, that his integrity was in question. Uh, they, they just were out to get Paul, and uh, he addresses those. But, but what we have here in chapter 1, picking up here in verse 12, and it'll run through 7, 16, Paul affirms his sincere commitment to the ministry and the Corinthian believers. He, he's going he's gonna to give a defense for his heart, for where he was, his commitment to his ministry, and to the believers there, to these people uh, that he's written to multiple times now and visited multiple times. So he's going to defend that. But here in our text for this morning, Paul addresses two accusations. One regarding conduct, the other as to the letters that he had written them and their evasive, as they saw it, evasive nature. They weren't direct, they weren't specific. It was like... He was uh, being shrewd, if you will. They, 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 they questioned that. So let's go ahead and read the verses now, verses 12 through 14, the text at hand. 
For our proud confidence is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially toward you. For we write nothing else to you than what you read and understand. And I hope you will understand until the end. Just as you also partially did understand us, that we are your reason to be proud as you are also our, our, ours in the day of our Lord Jesus. Now, what we learn here, what, what can we glean here as a church as Paul uh, starts this defense, if you will, on these two charges that are being leveled against him here. Uh, what do we learn? Well, your proposition is this. This is what we can take out of this. We need to let our service be such to have, uh, to excuse me, to leave us with a clear conscience. What we learn from Paul here in his, what he brings out here. What we can take home is we need to let our service be such as to leave us with a clear conscience, a clean conscience. One service is to be of such a nature or conduct, caliber, if you will, as to leave one with a clean conscience. How I deal with you, how, how I deal in this world, my conscience ought to not offend me, ought to not accuse me. I ought to be able to look at my, my ministry, my dealings, and have a clean conscience. Now I'm going to tell you, I've, I've had moments in my ministry, and I'm sure you've had moments in your life where you've had somebody maybe get out of whack, there's something wrong. In your relationship, something's happened. You know it's obvious. You read it, you feel it, you can, you sense it. And what do you do? You first look at your own conscience. And you ask the question, what have I done? And the, the most powerful thing is when your conscience comes back what? Clean. When you can't put a finger... I often will, even after I've done that, I say to the Lord, to the Holy Spirit, reveal to me what is the issue here. Because my conscience isn't telling me I've done anything that I'm aware of. And so it's very powerful. And Paul appeals to that as a defense, his own conscience. And we're going to see that. And it's important for us to live and function toward one another to where we have that. We can have a clean conscience. We, we have that clarity in our conscience. Now our text relates, again, Paul's response to two general charges that were leveled against him that established that, the proposition that we put forward. So with that, let's go ahead here and look at the defense for the first charge. Charge number one, shameless conduct and insincerity. Shameless conduct and insincerity. This comes out of verse 12. For our proud confidence is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God we have, conducted ourselves in the world and especially toward you. So the first charge that surfaces, the, what we're seeing uh, start to surface is they had a problem with his conduct and also his sincerity. Now the question is, is who specifically, who's raising these issues? It's not stated here. It doesn't tell us Who's, who's bringing this up or who's brought it up? Uh, chapters 10 and 13 seem to indicate it's these false teachers, but it, it, it really seems to point out uh, or point to, the finger seems to point to these, quote, super apostles who have elevated themselves almost to apostle status, to Paul's level, to the apostle status. 
And they're, they're, they're the ones who have the most to gain by, by uh, discrediting Paul. Put Paul down and elevate themselves. And, and I'm going to tell you, that's what a lot of false teachers are all about. It's not about getting out truth that they are embracing. It's about elevating themselves. They'll, 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 they'll point fingers in order to elevate, raise themselves and promote themselves. And so that, that seems to be the ones behind the scenes because that's, that's ultimately when the full frontal defense comes into play later in, in the book, the letter, uh, he's going to go right at them. Uh, that's who's in play here. So it seems uh, by what we have here that, that uh, one of their issues had to do with Paul's conduct and his sincerity. And he answers these by referring to, again, his own conscience, his own conscience regarding these matters. Paul says in that verse, he has what kind of a conscience? I have a clear conscience on this. I have a clear conscience on this as it related to his conduct and his sincerity toward the Corinthians. He had a clear conscience. He had, he had not, he had, he had not done anything that was inappropriate or not of the Lord as it related to his interactions with the people at Corinth. He says, our, our proud confidence is this. The testimony of our conscience. As Paul searched in his own heart for any merit on the charges, his conscience came back clean. And you know what I say? Praise God. Praise God for Paul. And I praise God when that's the case for me. And, and, it, and it a blessing when it is for you, when you know that your heart has been pure before the Lord in your relationship with a person or, or people or a group and issues are raised and you look at your own heart and your heart does not convict you. That is a proud confidence that you can have, that you know you did not do anything wrong that merits that the reaction that Paul had endured from this church. And that's what he tells my, my proud confidence is this. I have a clean conscience as it relates to my relationship with you. Now, Paul said three things about his conduct. First, he said it was with holiness. It was with holiness. That's the new American standard version. Uh, he had dealt with them uh, to put it another way, holiness in purity as a set apart. Holiness means set apart. He dealt with them in purity as a set apart instrument of God. We've, we've, we saw how Paul introduced himself. He knew exactly who he was in the Lord and he knew he was doing the Lord's work. And in that regard, that becomes the core for his ability to say, I have a clean conscience. Because he dealt with them as a set apart instrument for the Lord. Listen, if your heart is for the Lord, not for you, not even, in, even in, as it relates to individuals and entering their life, if it's about you and not about the Lord, we got a problem. We're on shaky ground. But if I'm here for the Lord, because I love the Lord and I love you, and I'm going to bring truth to bear in your life because I love you. But more importantly, because God has put it upon me as a pastor or, t uh, or an elder or, or a parent or a grandparent to enter the life of my child. I am an instrument of the Lord in that regard. And there isn't anything wrong that, that should convict us of wrong or conscience. Now, I'm going to tell you, we can also abuse our positions. But if we're coming from love. We, we will temper those words with that. We will seek prior to engagement wisdom from the Lord. How many times have you asked, Lord, give me the words. Lord, just help me to have the right words to say. Why? Because I want to be that instrument. I, want, I don't want to be. 
I don't want to have a, a bad conscience about what goes on here. And Paul didn't have that. He, he said, listen, I dealt with you in purity, in holiness, with a single mindedness. It, some translations translate it that way because they take the term not to be hagiatatai, but uh, ha, har la tatai. And they, they look similar in the language, but, but one means single mindedness. But what, whichever way it's translated, the point is Paul's conduct was what? It was honorable. It was honorable. It was pure. Listen, the Corinthians' problems were not Paul. <laughs> they weren't Paul. Paul was an instrument of the Lord. He, he dealt with them as a set-apart instrument of the Lord. He, second thing he says about his conduct, his conduct was with godly sincerity. Sincerity. This describes something which can bear the test of being held up to the light. This has an ancient uh, cultural uh, uh, application uh, where it fits in their culture. Vessels, pottery, fine pottery or, or vessels that, that were ornate or whatever, you know, that were made for decoration or whatever purpose. Uh, in the ancient culture, this term that we translate sincerity, it spoke of being held up to the light. You would take the, the pot, that pottery, and you could hold it to the light. And if you held it up to the light, you could see if there were cracks that were covered over. That there were like makeup on, on a pig. <laughs> they, they, they'd cover over the crack and sell it. You could, you'd hold it up to the light and you would look at it. And you could see if it was without cracks. And Paul's saying that his conduct, his conduct with them was with what? Godly <coughs> sincerity. What's he saying? It was held to the light and found to be without cracks. Without cracks. He had dealt honorably with them. He had dealt in purity with them. He had dealt with sincerity with them. Third, his conduct was not fleshly in fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God. See, Paul wasn't about the flesh or the world. He wasn't about the flesh or the world. And that is, he wasn't about self-serving, but he was about God. I love that about Paul. We all love that about Paul. Paul's got to go. I know we all have our favorites. I have old. I love David uh, in the Bible because I just love him. He was a warrior for the Lord from the time he was a young young man, barely even uh, you know a teenager, and he takes on Goliath. I love him. He was also a man after God's own heart, even in the midst of all of his moral failure and all that he'd gone through. He had a heart for the Lord. The Lord said that about David, that he was a man after his own heart. He, he loved the Lord. I love Daniel. But I must tell you, nobody takes the place of Paul with me. Paul from the Damascus Road never got over the grace of God in his life. He just never did. And everything about Paul was affected by that. His motives were always centered in that. They found their, 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 their core in grace. Grace realized, grace understood, and it affected how he related to the people of God. I pray that all of us had that aspect that really determined how we <clears throat> deal with each other as believers. This church lost sight of all of that. Paul never did. And he's saying, listen, you want to charge me with misconduct? Well, listen, I never came to you with fleshly wisdom, but I came to you by the grace of God, in the grace of God. He wasn't about serving himself. It was in God's grace he had, and he includes those with him, had conducted themselves in the world, in the world, and toward them. I love that. 
Because he says it's not even in how I've related to you alone. It's who we are even out here in the world. Paul didn't put on a different hat. You got the same Paul out there that you got on Sunday morning. He was Paul, saved by grace, taken by grace, and serving by grace. That's who he was. That's who he, that's who he, that's what he was about. He was about the Lord Jesus. And I'm telling you, when you have that going for you, they can say what they want, but if you know your heart, you can say, my proud confidence is this. I have a clean conscience. And that's what he says to these believers here. It's such a powerful challenge to us. I, I pray that we can all make such a claim as to our service and our conduct toward others. Paul had no skeletons, it seems, in his closet as it related to the Corinthian believers. There was no shoe to drop or any kind of dealing. They're, they weren't going to find anything when they, when they went back through everything and read the letters and, and they looked at the visits and what he said when he was here and what he, who, whose hand he didn't shake or whatever that they might say, oh, see, see that he wasn't sincere because he didn't shake brother whatever's hand or whatever, make it a case. Paul's like, listen, I know my heart and I know when I was with you who I was and what I was about, and I, my conscience is absolutely clean. Praise God for Paul. A couple related points here before we move on. One has to do with a caution. I just want to say this uh, it, 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 as a pastor, as it relates to what we're seeing here and Paul, these accusations that are brought to Paul and, and they had, had literally gone through the entire believing community at Corinth. And you say, well, how do I know that? Because he's been, he's written them. He will have written them four letters, three visits by the time that's his interaction with this church. So, so I know that this had fingered out through the whole body. Now here's the caution before we move on to this next uh, charge. Caution is this. I, I admonish you as brothers and sisters in Christ, you be on your guard. When someone casts doubts against a brother or sister in Christ, especially when you have no person, no personal knowledge, you've never observed the given point that's being raised as an issue. Now, why do I throw that caution out? Because I'm going to tell you something. I've been on, I've been on the receiving end of this. I'm sure you have. Seeds of doubt once spread cause Real problems. People who have loved their pastor and have no reason to not love him because somebody whispered in their ear something that was not right, that was wrong, that you have no basis for. Now there's a cloud over your pastor or your elder or your brother or your sister because somebody said something. They, they throw out an accusation. That's what Paul had to face. The Corinthian believers, these false teachers are coming in here and they're saying all this crud about Paul and they all they had to do, what they should have done, is looked at the track record. Looked at his ministry amongst them and they should have been able to say, Paul's got a clean conscience as it relates to how he dealt with us and how he lived out in this world before us. Those seeds that people sow against you with a brother or sister in Christ, those are hard to overcome because now all of a sudden things that were never a problem with us, with you or that other believer, whatever, are now on your radar. Now you're looking for those things. And it's up the devil, to be honest with you. It's meant to be divisive, it's meant to be destructive, and it's meant to hurt the unity and the peace of the brethren. And so it's a caution. I just put it out there to you. You, you need to be aware of that. I, I, I'm telling you, and, I, and I'm not saying I'm something. I'm not. But, but I, I will check people oftentimes. I will tell people, listen, I've never seen that in that person, in, in this person. I've never seen that. 
And you know what usually happens to that conversation and that discussion on that? All of a sudden it's, oh, what were we talking about? Yeah, that, those cookies were good the other night. <laughs> we, we've left that because what happened is there was getting no play time, no, no hearing. Because I know better. Listen, I, I, I always throw that out there too. Listen, this is somebody I've broken bread. I've, I've shared the communion table, the Lord's table with this person for years. I've had them in my home. They've had me in their home. I've prayed with them. I've gone through trials that I've never seen what you're talking about. And I'm going to tell you that that issue is done. At least, at least they're not going to bring it here. Because they, they know that, that I'm as it relates to me, that person has a clean conscience with me. They've never offended. They've never wronged. And, and I, so I caution that. Second caution. I want to put, the, not a caution, just a second point before we move on. The first one was a caution, a warning. The second one I want to bring up is conscience does not equal Holy Spirit. You need to be aware of that. I'm not sitting here, nor is Paul trying to say that his conscience is the equivalent of the Holy Spirit of God. They're two different things. But I will say this. A godly person's conscience is usually a good barometer for the soul. And what I'm saying is, is if you're living for the Lord and you're doing uh, the things that God would have you do in your life, being in his word, worshiping the Lord, loving God, loving people, ministering, just living your Christian life, then your conscience is really a good thing. It's a really good indicator uh, for your soul. It, it will send up red flags, but it is not the Holy Spirit, okay? The Holy Spirit is the third person, the one triune God, and he is indwells us, and he's the one who definitely flips the red flag when we're in sin. He's the one who, who puts it in our mind to, with no question that this is wrong, or this is right, or this is what you should do in, in, as it relates to truth being brought out of the Word of God, the conviction. There, there's a difference. So I, I just want you to understand that. Don't, don't go off and... To go contrary to the word of God and say your conscience, my conscience is good on this. No, it's not. You're not reading this right. If it goes against truth, you're not going to say to me, I have a clean conscience because I'm going to say you can't have. So somebody's lying here uh, to themselves. So you need to keep that in mind. It doesn't mean that it's the Holy Spirit. But it doesn't also mean that it can't be used as a defense because Paul uses it. Because Paul was living for the Lord. And he told him, holiness. You know, I'm, I'm with you in holiness. And, and with uh, single-mindedness. So anyway, uh, let's go on. Second charge. The second charge in our text for this morning that he addresses uh, is evasive writing. Verses 13 and 14. He says, for we write nothing else to you than what you read and understand. And I hope you will understand until the end. Just as you also partially did understand us, that we are your reason to be proud as you are also ours in the day of our Lord Jesus. Now at this point in Paul's relationship with the believers, he has written to them three times at this point. And it seems that these detractors, these enemies of Paul, accused him of being evasive in his writing, uh, using sh shrewdness. Another way would be he was manipulative in his writing. He wasn't being specific. He wasn't putting fingers right on the issues. He just was putting it out there. Now, so they picked up on this. What did they pick up? Uh, probably on, on his pointed corrections that were not altogether specific in 1 Corinthians. When he's correcting him, the, the people, he didn't name everybody. Here, Bill's doing this. Harriet's over here doing this. And Mary, he's got issues over here. And you're all doing this. And, you know, he didn't do that. He didn't do that. 
What he did was now concerning. You know, if you go to 1 Corinthians, you move right through 1 Corinthians and you can find all their issues because they're, they're introduced by now concerning. <laughs> and he tells what the issue is. And I love this about Paul because this is a real powerful uh, way to uh, lead, teach, admonish people. And that is, is Paul just put forth the truth of God's word and let the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit. Now, were there times where Paul put the finger on people? Yodia and Synecdoche, he named them. You two, you two ladies need to shape up and quit your bickering and fighting. And he read of the riot act. Demas. You know, this one, he put fingers on people who abandoned him, named him. But when he wrote first, he said, now concerning. Well, what's that about? He wasn't being shrewd. He was letting God be God in the lives of the people who had problems in that area without fingering them. Listen, who I had never been in a church, but I've been told that there, there are preachers who would call people down from the pulpit. You know what you did, Rusty. And everybody here does. And God said, you shape up. How would you like that? Paul didn't do that. He said, this is what, listen, we got a problem here. We got a problem here. You're abusing the gifts. You're going after certain things you need to understand. And he lays out the body principle. And the importance of every gift. And then what's that do? It tells the ones out here are doing that. I don't have to have him finger me. You know what I mean? Say this, you're, you're the culprit or you all, you know. He put the truth out and let the spirit of God be the Holy Spirit. Amen. By the way, I love that for this, the way we preach here. Expositional teaching. I believe it's the only way to go. Because this keeps me in check. Do you realize that? See, I don't lord it over you. I don't get up here and lord it over you. Now, I'm not opposed to coming to your house and talking to you personally about any issue you may be having. And I'll be honest with you with the word of God. I will. And I'll say you're wrong or, you know, and because I, I love you. But I'm not going to use the pulpit for that. I preach God's word and then he brings that to bear. The beauty is, is you go home and I've had it happen. Who hasn't had it happen? Pastor's preaching. You go home. I think he was preaching right at me. Well, I'm, you can't hold me guilty of that. Because if I end in chapter, in verse 14, get, where am I picking up next? See what I'm saying? So it's not Dan being the Holy Spirit or trying to be. I'm preaching God's truth. And the Holy Spirit's the Holy Spirit. And he'll bring it to bear. Now, you may have problems, and we may need to talk through some texts, and that's just part of being a pastor teacher. Your pastor loving you, and you loving me, and we're trying to get to the right understanding, you know? But we don't want to be that. And Paul didn't. He, he, just, he, was, he wasn't opposed to doing it, warning and naming a person. But it wasn't the way he approached churches. He gave them the truth. For, for the most part, he gave them the truth and let the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit. And he wrote exactly the same way. We've referenced it over and over. And he, he did so so that they would have an understanding. And verse 14 is proof of that purpose. Because he says, just as you also partially did understand us. You know what he's saying when he said that? He's saying, you've come back to us. See, the Corinthians had bought the lie. They were buying into those super apostles accusations against Paul. And he's saying, listen, I wrote it. I wrote it out and, and I wrote it so you'd understand it. And the proof is, is that you, you got it because guess what? They're coming back to him. They're understanding him. And he goes on to say it here. You partially did understand us. And listen to what he says, that we are your reason to be proud. 
What, what is he saying? That the apostle Paul and those brothers loved us and interacted with us. And they, were, they brought the truth of God's word to us. And we grew through what they brought to us. They could take pride in that. And then he says, and you also are ours in that you've repented, you've grown, you're doing the right things in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because at the Bema, you know what? At the Bema, there's none of this foolishness that goes on. Because we're dealing directly with the, the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ. He sees it all. He knows every motive, and, he, and it's all going to be weighed in the balance at that point. Not salvation, but, but reward and loss. And he's saying, you, we, have an, we, we are connected, the Corinthians and him. I take pride in you, and you take pride in in us in a in a godly way that that they are they that he can be uh, proud of their relationship the bottom line paul asserts that in both the church and in the world his conduct had been with god given purity and openness and governed by god's grace this was the testimony of his conscience in turn, we need to let our service be such as to leave us with a clear and a clean conscience. That should be our heart's desire, is to, to, to interact with one another in such a way that we do not have our conscience telling us guilty. You got a problem here, and it's you. You deal with your... You let, you, you, you let your, your, your service be of such a nature to where your conscience is clean. I, want to, I came across a, a, a funny story to me as it pertains to consciences, and i wrap up with this. And it's a story that's told about Sir Arthur Doyle. I don't know if you know who that is, but he is the founder, the creator, if you will, of the character uh, Sherlock Holmes. And Watson, he wrote those books. And uh, he decided he was going to play a practical joke on 12 of his friends. Uh, this is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> he sent them each a tel telegram that read, Flee at once, all is discovered. Within 24 hours, all 12 left the country. <laughs> Something's wrong with the conscience on that one. Listen, my desire is, and Paul's desire is, and it should be, that our proud confidence may be the testimony of our, of our consciences, that if they're clean, they're backed up by lives of purity, and sincerity. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you this morning. We thank you for your word. I pray that you'd minister your word to each of our hearts as you desire. Bring, bring forth that growth that you, you want, that fruit that you want in our lives uh, as you bring these truths to bear. Bless each one for being out today. Bless our, our fellowship we might enjoy throughout the day with one another. Uh, may you bless our week out ahead for you, Lord. Help us count for you in all things. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.